in this time of sort of civic dialogue about what we mean to each other in different community groups and age groups and people with different abilities, et cetera, um, it's important for us to know who that is. Um, we constantly get the, you know, the stop sign that says Wichita Falls isn't growing. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, that what we're saying is true, but what we do know is that Wichita Falls is changing. The demographics are changing, who lives here is changing, people's economic abilities are changing. Um, and then that will have another shift, I imagine, that over the next 12 months. So I just thought it was really important for us to hear from you, even at this point in the uh, overall project that you're managing along with other things about who lives here. I thought it was important for us to hear your voice. And if you don't mind, we are recording this so we can share it with our board members. But I want to introduce, or most of you know Karen, everybody here knows Karen, I suppose. Well, thank you, Miss Margie and Miss Ann. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. And as I mentioned to Margie, this is really just scratching the surface on demographics because most people don't necessarily think about how statistics impacts their everyday life. Uh, next slide. This it really typifies the diversity we have in Texas. It represents all different backgrounds, all different races, all different ethnicities. But one of the things we do know is that Texas is growing and it's changing. And one of the other key things is it's critical that this year, the year of the decennial census count, we have a complete and accurate count. Next slide. Texas is the second largest state in the country, and it is second in area to Alaska. But in terms of people, Texas growth exceeds that of all other states, and it's projected to continue that trend beyond 2020. Texas added over three and a half million people between the last census in 2010 and 2018. We're on track to surpass the number of people added in that last census when we gained four congressional seats. So you can see on the table that we're projected to gain three more seats. We're, we're just a bit ahead of Florida with its growth rate. And then at the bottom, you can see that California and Minnesota are projected to actually each lose a congressional seat. So there's a lot that's riding on the 2020 census. And if we don't get a complete count, we may not get those additional three seats. Next slide. One of the things that's interesting, uh, we utilize a lot of data from the Texas State Data Center. They are a wealth of information, highly recommend visiting them. So if you look at recent estimates from 2018 to 2019, we added just over 367,000 people within the state of Texas. So that averages just over a thousand people a day were either coming or growing in Texas. So that's really split up three ways. How do we gain people? Obviously natural increase, having more births than deaths, which we did. We had 483 persons per day. And then the other is attributed to migration, whether that's international migration coming from other countries to Texas or other states, those people relocating to Texas. And that accounted for about 523 people per day. And domestic migration has surpassed the international. Next slide. And this is interesting because it really gives you a, a, a trend. You can look at from 2011 through 2019 in Texas, and you can see kind of the ebbs and flows of the change in natural increase, international migration, and then um, migration within the country of people coming to Texas. We're seeing that the trend continues with the domestic migration increasing at a rate that surpasses the international migration. There was a significant drop due to multiple reasons, multiple factors between 2018 and 2019. Uh, the international 
migration dropped significantly from 104,000 to or just over 65,000. We know there's been a lot of focus on the border states and changes and that obviously has a major factor into the number of people coming in from other countries. But you see a, a slowdown from 2015 to 2018 of domestic migration, and then you see a spike between 2018 and 2019. And so that trend is expected to continue moving forward. Next slide. This is an interesting map that I wanted to share with you all. This is looking at estimated population across the state of Texas, 254 counties. We all know this is definitely a large state. And with that, if you click Anne on the mouse, you see what's called the Texas Population Triangle. We hear about this a lot. Unfortunately, we're not quite in that area. We're a little bit farther to the Northwest. But that's where we're seeing the majority of the growth. And then click again, and we will see the I-35 corridor. So when you look at the map and the dark purple green areas, that's where you see the majority of the concentration of population in Texas. So when you look at West and North Texas, it tends to be more rural and more sparsely populated. There's approximately 86% of the state either along the I-34 corridor and then further west. Next slide. And this has been, I'd say, every decade in between the census. And as you get near the next decennial census, the talk of the town, well, did we gain population? Are we losing population? You know, everybody has their own assessment and speculation. Well, Census data and Texas State Data Center 2019 population estimates released this spring. Some good news. We may not have been a significant growth county, but Wichita County did not lose population. So some people may say, well, it, you know, we're not part of that growth corridor. How come we're not getting all that great growth and all the development and people? Well, there's small gains to be pleased that we have. With everything we've been through the last decade with a nationally televised, you know, covered drought, 2013 and 2014, and economic changes and downturns at a world economic scale and also within our country, you know, there's things to be thankful for that, yes, our growth might have only been 0.3, 0.4%, but it was still holding steady, stable, not a decline. When you look at the West and the Panhandle areas, the orange and the red areas, they significantly lost. There were 104 counties between 2010 and 2019 that lost population. And we're thankful that Wichita County was not part of that. When you look at what's considered our metropolitan statistical area or MSA population, Archer, Clay, and Wichita are the three counties that comprise that. Now we did see population loss in Clay County to the east and Archer to the south. And we expect, looking at statewide trends, that we will continue to see similar growth patterns in the central the very south and to the east in the state. Looking at nearly 95% of the state's population growth out to 2050 will occur in metro areas. Next slide. So as Texas grows, we continue to be diverse and we continue to have an older population. Next slide. So when you look at the changes over the last eight to nine years, we're starting to see a change in the composition of the population at the state level and also locally. As of the 2000 census, about 53% of Texas population was non-Hispanic white. 32 was considered or identified as Hispanic and 11% were considered non-Hispanic African-American. By 2010, that population 
composition had changed. And we were about 45% non-Hispanic, 38 Hispanic. The Hispanic Latino population continues to be a major driver of our economy and in the population growth in Texas. Between 2000 and 2010, for every 10 people added to the state population, six were Hispanic. And so we anticipate that this trend will continue. And you can see in the pie graphs the change from the last official count in 2010 to 2018 estimates that you're seeing a shift in the composition of the population. Next slide. Looking at breakdown by age, Texas had over 3.55 million people added to the population over the last nine years. But that growth is not distributed evenly. One recent report from the Texas Tribune highlighted that shifting Texas population with continued growth with the Hispanic population. And it's anticipated that within the next two years that Hispanics will comprise the largest population group within the state. And that's expected to continue through at least 2030. During 2018, Texas had almost a growth of nine to one in the Hispanic population versus non-Hispanic white. And so when you look at the uh, graph, you can see that the fastest growth has been with our Hispanic identified and Asian populations. And we're also seeing an increase in the 65 plus category, which is something that impacts different programs and services that are provided within our communities. Next slide. This gives a breakdown of looking at the actual percent change in the different age cohorts. So, you know, we continue to see growth in each area under 18, our 18 to 64, essentially our working age population. But then when you start to look at our retirement group, our 65 plus and then our 85 plus, we had a significant growth in the state, 38.4% change between 2010 and 2018. So that's a significant group to consider moving forward. Next slide. I enjoy looking at these maps and, and discussing them because it's interesting to see really how does Wichita County fit in when you look at trends across the state. So this is looking at the trend of aging, looking at median age by county. And so the dark green areas are where you're seeing younger population. And then when you get to the red, you're looking at counties that have an older population. And the trend is that we're seeing that that population is getting older. Wichita County is in that dark red category. It's part of the 86 counties that were identified as having an older population and it continuing with aging. So we will continue to grow in that 65 plus category. There were only six counties that are in the dark green that became younger in their population during this time period. And there were 31 of those that were initially young counties that aged during that time frame. There were some changes in West Texas because it was related to some urban centers that had some influx of younger migrant employees for service labor with the oil field industry and with some meat packing plants in those areas. Next slide. So what do we see looking out? What do we see to 2030? What do we see in 30 years to 2050? Next slide. The Texas State Data Center prepares population projections uh, using four different scenarios. This one that we felt um, was really a moderate growth. This is looking at one that is based on the 2010 to 2015 growth patterns. And so we're looking at an estimated total population by the end of 2020 of 29.7 million. And by 2030, just under 35 million, and then out to 2050, 
it's anticipated that will grow to 47 million. So that's a significant growth. Over 30 years, we're looking at just under 18 million people being added to the state of Texas. Next slide. And so when you try to look at that population growth, and this, this mirrors really what we've seen the last few years with the change in race and ethnic growth within the state of Texas. You can see when you look at the first two lines on the graph, uh, they represent non-Hispanic white population and our Hispanic population, that you see the crossover of the Hispanic population, the dark navy line in 2022. That's where we're anticipated that our Hispanic population will outpace growth of our non-Hispanic white and continue to grow at a fast pace. We've also started to see that we're having growth with our Asian population and they appear to be growing at an ever increasing rate. Next slide. Now this is looking at the projection based on age cohorts. So as we mentioned, the 65 plus age group is projected to grow by nearly 3 million by 2030. So that's a significant group in our population and significant buying power because most of those people are retired. However, not all have the same buying power. It's a mix. So in 2010, our 65 plus group comprise just over 10% of the total state population. By 2030, that's anticipated to make up close to 16%. Next slide. This is one that I wanted to throw in. Um, it, it may bring up some questions. So what were the top 10 Texas counties for growth and what were the ones that had the least numeric change? So I've got Wichita County highlighted. Unfortunately, I think we all understand we were not one of the top 10 growth counties. Um, those, as we mentioned, tend to be in that Texas population triangle. So Harris County, Bayer, Dallas, Tarrant. So essentially your Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth areas they were each projected to add over 1 million people by 2050. In 2018, 47% of Texas Hispanics lived in the five biggest counties. So obviously we have some across the entire state. We have need for different service workers, but we tend to see more concentration in our urban centers. Although we're characterized by having rapid and high growth, in Texas, 99 of 254 counties were projected to have declines. And unfortunately, when you look at the table on the right, Wichita County is one of those when you look out to 2050. Now, obviously things can change and that's a good thing. Among the counties with the greatest population of losses, they're mostly viewed as being in more sparsely populated areas, particularly to the west, in the east and in the south. Two counties, in particular Potter, which is the county seat, is the county for Amarillo, and then Wichita with Wichita Falls as the county seat. They were the two counties with populations over 100,000 that were among the top ones anticipated to have the greatest population loss. So definitely something to consider. Next slide, please. So how does this all play into what we're currently in, the year of 2020 and the decennial census? Well, when you look where we currently are, looking at estimates, and then you look at projections, what is anticipated through 2050, the 2020 census plays a critical role because it is the next year where we get actual data. It's not survey data, it's not extrapolated. This is the actual count. And that's why it's so critical that we get everyone counted. So I, how many of you know what special day this is? Any guesses? 
Well, this is Constitution Day. So happy Constitution Day. And what's one of the things mandated and outlined in our Constitution? It is that there is a census every 10 years and that we count every person living in the United States. And so we're currently winding down. You may have heard on the news. Hopefully you've heard the task force, which Ms. Margie is part of, encouraging people to be counted before September 30th. Why is it important? Well, it helps determine how many seats we have in the House of Representatives and also the number of electoral co college votes that each state gets. And that information the following year, which will be in 2021, is utilized by cities like Wichita Falls, the state of Texas, to help redraw congressional, legislative, and local political boundaries. Businesses utilize census data on a regular basis when they're looking to expand a business. If they want to locate in a new market, that census data that's collected is critical for them making decisions. One of the concerns with the census ending early, it was supposed to end October 31st, but was pushed back a month. And so we have a concern with that, that we will lose people being counted in some of our underrepresented population groups and in what are considered hard to count groups in our rural areas, immigrants, and persons of color. Next slide. What else is impacted by the census? Well, obviously, lots of funds. This is the best way that the federal government has determined at this point in history to allocate funding. And so, excuse me, <coughs> Trillions of dollars are distributed based on the official census counts. There was over one and a half trillion federal dollars allocated based on census data. Excuse me. In 2016, um, really good information coming out of George Washington University on how census derived data is connected with allocation of federal dollars. 55 federal programs help distribute over $883 billion to states, to local governments, to nonprofits, businesses, and households. So we have a lot riding in the next 10 years on the numbers we get this year. It affects everything. It affects infrastructure. It affects healthcare programs. It affects public education. And so, that's why we're concerned that if there is an undercount, we're losing funding. And what happens? We know there's still people here that need those services. And if there's a lack of funding for those services, there's a lot of burden that falls on our nonprofit community to help fill those gaps. And so they're anticipating if there's a 1% undercount, it could mean a loss of 300 million in funding per year over the next 10 years. And what we've done with the task force is try to drill those numbers down from a state level to a local level. And what we've estimated is that for every person that's missed in the 2020 census in Wichita Falls, it will result in us losing $20,000 over a 10 year period. So if you think about a family of five, that's $100,000 that's not coming back just from that one family of five over the next decade to help provide critical services, maybe for their children, maybe for special needs, maybe for supplemental nutritional programs and CHIP. A lot of things are impacted by the census numbers. Next slide. So we've talked about who is underrepresented a lot of times in the decennial census. Who are these hard to count populations? Well, we've mapped those and one of the things we wanted to point out is that we are fairly lucky in Wichita Falls. We believe we had a minor undercount after 2010. But when you look at this graphic and you see the orange and the red areas, those are significant portions of the state that had a major undercount. And a lot of those are places where we have rural populations. They're hard to reach, hard to access, migrant populations, English may be a barrier, uh, a lot of different factors. In 2010, it's estimated over 240,000 Texans 
were missed in the census. And they estimate almost 7 million or 25% of the population in Texas are in hard to count areas. And so what we've seen is there's a concern that we may have almost 500,000 people missed this census just in Texas. And obviously when you combine the decennial census with a global pandemic, it just exacerbates the difficulty in getting everyone counted. Next slide. So there's essentially nine groups of people that are considered often underrepresented and hard to count. People of color, that includes our African American population, also our Hispanic population. We have the second largest number of Hispanics and African Americans in Texas. We have the third largest number of Asian populations in all the states in the US. Immigrants, there's a variety of reasons why immigrants are either afraid or very hesitant to complete the decennial census, especially with current situations with a wall being built along the border and changes continually with immigration policies. They're fearful that by filling in this one simple form, it could forever change the future of their family. Children under five, you would not think that children, young children that are counted by their parents were undercounted, but there was a massive national undercount of children five and under in 2010. Single parent households, there's an estimated 1.2 million Texas households that are single parent, and the majority of those have children under age 18. Next slide. People with limited language capabilities, limited English proficiency. That's one thing that's beneficial with the 2020 census. It's available in 13 languages. So they have tried to identify the top languages that are utilized throughout the country that they needed to ensure information was available. So it could be completed by everyone. People in multifamily housing, traditional uh, renters. It's difficult when you go into an apartment complex or if you can get permission from the apartment manager to enter the complex facility to ensure people that didn't complete their census are counted. Larger households. Approximately 5% of Texas households are considered crowded and that means more than one person is living per room in a household and then lower income populations. A lot of times the census is just one extra thing that has to be done. It's not a life or death type of form. If they get to it, great. If they don't, they have other higher priorities that they need to deal with. Next slide. And so when you start to look at how are we doing in compared to 2010, are we on target? Are we ahead? Are we behind? When you look at this, this is a map of the United States broken down by congressional district. You can see Texas is not where we wanted it to be at the end of July with counts. We definitely were behind our 2010 rate. Locally, as of yesterday, our self-response rate was 62.8%. And so we know we still have significant number of people to be counted. Next slide. This really takes that information and it breaks it down by county. And it compares looking at how are we doing across the state compared to 2010. Obviously, there's still much work to be done in the next two weeks to ensure that we do have a solid count for Texas. Wichita Falls was not doing too badly. We're just a small percentage behind 2010. The final 2010 self-response was 60, just over 67%. So we're close, but we're not quite there. Next slide. And this is something that's been really beneficial that they've implemented in 2020. And you can go and check the daily uh, self-response rates online. You can look at a national, state, 
county or city, and it even breaks it down even further to congressional district and census tract. Next slide. And then you can go and you can start to look at and see how are we doing in comparison to the state? How are we doing as a state compared to national response rates? And so one of the things they started doing beginning of September after they had a, about a month of the non-response follow-up. So in other words, the census takers were able to start to get back out and resume operations that had been put on hold. And so right now, the national numbers are just under 92% combined response. So that's the numbers of self-response plus what the census takers have collected. Texas is just under 91%. And then looking at Wichita Falls and Wichita County, unfortunately, they haven't provided the combined numbers at this point. So far, the Census Bureau has only provided the self-response numbers. So we know we have more people counted than what show on the self-response, but we have no quantitative number. So we know that we need to continue the message of making sure everyone is counted. Next slide. So bringing it back to the local area, we wanted to show you by census tract how things look in 2020. So you can see the darker purple areas are higher response rates. So we've got some really great tracks that uh, have had a good response to the 2020 census. We're really happy about that. But we also have a lot of yellow beige areas, which are our lower response areas. And then you can see to the south, really, I'd say south of 1954, the Lakeside City area in Archer County, we have, it's a rural area, and so we have a low response rate there. So what we've tried to do with the task force is target our final census budget the month of September and look at targeted social media in the census tracts that were low response, which were between 10 and 12 census tracts had less than 51% response rate. And also with our media campaign, we requested volunteers. We may have had some voluntold people, but we appreciate what they did to put together a census promo that really looked at why is the census important to me? Why is it important to public transportation? Why is it important for public education? Why does it matter for our business community? We wanted people to be able to identify with others that value the census. Next slide. So you can see what things look like currently with this census 2020 that's active. Here's what the final maps were by tract for 2010. You see a significant difference. Obviously, in the life of most of us, the history of the census going back to 1790, there have been periods where they have experienced difficult challenges. They have overcome, just as we are overcoming the COVID pandemic. However, it's certainly impacted the response rates with 2020. When you look at 2010, we only had two tracks, potentially three, that were lower response areas. And next slide. When you overlay those and you look at the map, there are still significant areas we need to ensure people either hear the message or understand the message that they need to be counted. And so next slide, our challenge to all of you to help make a difference in our community because we really view this as the easiest way that you can help guarantee a better future for you, your family, and this community over the next 10 years is simply taking a few minutes to go online to my2020census.gov or call 844-330-2020 to complete the census. So we would encourage you to ask people in your sphere of influence. Try to ask 10 people within the next 13 days, that's all we have left. Did you fill in your census? Did you make sure you got it completed? Because even if just one person that you reach out to 
fills in their census because you mentioned something and reminded them that, oh, I'd forgotten to do that during all the pandemic and all the homeschooling. That makes a difference. That's another $20,000 that will come back to Wichita Falls to help fund services. 